Hello, welcome to Rocky Mountain Wild Oil and Gas webinar. I um, this is Allison Galinsky, and I'm joined by Megan Mueller. And I'll go ahead and get started. What the two of us are going to talk about? Um, we're going to say hi. I'm going to talk about the oil and gas leasing process and about the tools that Rocky Mountain Wild provides to help folks who are engaging in watching the oil and gas leasing process, the federal one, uh, and making sure that it is not messing up the environment as much as we can. Then. Uh, the heart of the presentation is going to be where Megan's going to talk about how to use our resources to write comments. Her focus as a biologist is on um, issues related to endangered species. And I know that other organizations are focusing on things like air quality with some good successes or um, at least uh, a recent lawsuit. Um, and um, then if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about some recent lease sales and some successes. Um, and we'll have a little time at the end for questions. Thank you very much. I'm excited. I see from our participant list that we have 36 people on. I'm not sure if this counts you twice if you're on the phone and the computer, but still, that's really exciting to know that this many of you were able to find time in the middle of the day to come and learn more about the rather difficult and not very glamorous oil and gas leasing process. We work for Rocky Mountain Wild. Rocky Mountain Wild uh, is an organization that works to protect biodiversity. So we're trying to protect plants and animals and the places that they need to thrive and making sure they have room to roam through these places. Um, I am Allison Galinsky. I'm joined by Megan Mueller. Why don't you tell a little bit about your history with oil and gas leasing in Rocky Mountain Wild? Sure. I'm Rocky Mountain Wild Senior Conservation Biologist and my name is Megan Mueller. And I work to protect biodiversity by engaging citizen scientists in research and also bringing the best available science to collaborative processes. And I've spent about 10 years working on commenting on oil and gas lease sales. Um, so I have quite a bit of experience with that as well that I'll be sharing with you today. Okay, and I'm uh, Allison Galinsky, and I've been with Rocky Mountain Wild for a little for over 10 years also, not quite as long as Megan. And um, I do the GIS mapping work, and that includes things like figuring out boundaries of areas that we want to protect. I've worked on several maps for several of the areas in the core uh, legislation that was just introduced. Uh, I've also been working to identify issues with places that have been proposed for oil and gas leases. So let me talk a little bit, start by talking a little bit about the oil and gas lease sale process. I think many of you are uh, familiar with this at the high level, um, but I don't know what everyone's level of expertise is, so I'll try to cover some of the basics. Start with some of the acronyms and why they're important. The Bureau of Land Management is a government agency within the Department of Interior. The Department of Interior includes the National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, a lot of the agencies that manage public lands. The Forest Service is one land management agency that's not under the Department of Interior. It's under the Department of Agriculture because, you know, we need to grow trees so we can have um, places to go skiing, uh, actually. 
uh, recreation is one of the biggest uses of the National Forest. Back to the Bureau of Land Management, one of the things they do is they manage oil and gas leasing on public lands, uh, federal public lands, and also on lands where the federal government owns the mineral rights. Sometimes the federal government owns the mineral rights underneath private lands. This is called split estate. So there are a lot of private lands in eastern Colorado, in um, the northwestern Colorado, where the um, Bureau of Land Management can lease the lands, even though the surface is owned by uh, private individuals or by the uh, state of Colorado sometimes. So how do you go around if you work for an oil and gas company and you want to lease some land? You start by submitting an expression of interest. You tell the Bureau of Land Management where you want to lease. Uh, some land, and they find out, they check, make sure no one else has leased that land, and that it's land that they are allowed to lease. Um, and if so, they start a process to analyze whether that's in, uh, appropriate. And that's where the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, comes in, uh, which defines the process by which they analyze it and that requires public input. It doesn't require that they do what the public says, but it does require that they pay attention to what the public says and that they are analyzing the impact to the environment of leasing. They um, usually will respond by either creating an environmental analysis or recently that a lot of times they're doing a determination of NEPA adequacy where they're saying, okay, we created a management plan for this part of the state, whatever state they're working on. It already talks about oil and gas leasing. We don't have to do anything else. Um, we're fairly skeptical at Rocky Mountain Wild, as most of the organizations where you work are, that NEPA has been adequately uh, addressed and there are lawsuits in place trying to address this. Um, and then, they, if they do a DNA, a determination of NEPA adequacy, they're done, they can um, offer the parcels for sale. If they do an environmental analysis, then they find that there's no significant impact. What they are supposed to do is they take out any parcels where there would be a significant impact and then lease the rest. Uh, we may disagree that there's no significant impact, but that's the process. After the land is leased, that does not end the process, the next state, uh, stage after the uh, company or individual who leased the land, um, then they apply for a permit to drill on that land. We're not going to talk about that process because I don't understand it that well, but um, that is another opportunity to make sure that they People are following the rules around where they're allowed to drill and where they're not, um, and to um, participate. But it's not as easy because there usually are multiple entities involved. The state uh, tracks the permits, if it's BLM land, then the BLM is involved, if it's state or county land. Yeah, again, I don't understand that process as well. So here's a um, run through of what I was talking about. You start with an expression of interest. Steps two and three are part of the NEPA process. They do a scoping where they um, sometimes solicit comments uh, at that point where they just determine, done a really quick determination of 
based on the expression of interest, these parcels are in places we're allowed to offer, uh, and we're going to start an analysis. Then they do a draft analysis. Again, they may or may not at that point allow people to provide comments. If it's an environmental assessment, then they're supposed to allow comments if the NEPA is adequate. They often do allow comments anyway, but it's not as clear that they're required to. Then finally, um, once they've completed the analysis, they've reviewed the comments, they put out a sale notice. And at this point, you are no longer commenting. The technical term is you are protesting. And um, at that point, the protest that you write, if it has a chance to succeed, needs to be very uh, technical and detailed, showing that the Bureau of Land Management did not perform the analysis properly for specific reasons. However, it is okay to protest even if you're not all that technical because it shows the BLM and more importantly, it shows government officials that are um, paying attention that uh, people are interested. Uh, finally, they have the sale. The picture here is what things used to look like when they had in-person auctions. Now it's all done online. Um, and then after, um, before the sale, people can try to um, indicate that they want a parcel. And if no one else wants it, they just get it. After the sale, there's opportunities to get parcels that weren't sold. Um, and then finally, people pay uh, however much uh, it, they've offered. And um, then it moves on to the permitting stage. I've just gotten a question from Mary Hertig. Uh, can you speak to BLM's mandate to offer leases, even if there aren't any good leases? Uh, for example, the cameo leases outside Palisades. I have heard this from BLM managers, but I don't truly understand what this means. I also don't fully understand it, but I have heard the same thing uh, when the um, BLM, there was recently some new rules that went into place that I'm going to talk about, and it became uh, much more important to the Bureau of Land Management, to the, um, it became part, a more important part of the mission of the Bureau of Land Management to support the energy independence mandate of the administration. And therefore, they are required to have a sale um, four times a year, whereas before it was a little more optional. They're required to offer parcels everywhere around the state. And it looks like we've, we've also had gotten some indication based on um, doing the Freedom of Information Act request that sometimes they are offering parcels in areas that people have not requested. So that's my take on it. Um, Matt Sandler at Rocky Mountain Wild has more information about that. And if you email me, I can put you in touch. Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N, at RockyMountainWild.org, and I'll have more on that. I'll have my email address up at the end. Uh, we have an infographic that we put together about the process for oil and gas leasing. It's more, a lot of what I said, however, this little pipe shows that there are places along the way after there are comments where the parcels may be removed. There are There is a lease sale in Wyoming next 
weekend and there were some parcels that were removed from that sale after the sale notice came out uh, because of a conflict with some um, area. I don't remember what it was, but it was an area where uh, likely the state said that wasn't a good place to lease. Wasn't a lot of parcels, but it was better than nothing. And getting back to what I was saying before, there have been some changes to the process. In early 2018, there was an instructional memorandum to the Bureau of Land Management um, trying to get rid of some of the reforms to the process, leasing process that were put into place under the Obama administration. Uh, some of the changes are um, intended to um, shorten the pro to um, shorten the t amount of time that people have to the public has to be engaged. It's intended to streamline things for the Bureau of Land Management and to streamline things for industry. So in the past, um, in a lot of states, the sales would happen um, quarterly and one quarter they would cover eastern Colorado, another quarter they might cover um, northwest Colorado and so on. Um, and that meant that if you had an expression of interest in somewhere in eastern Colorado and you got it in right about the time that that sale was happening, you wouldn't get a chance to buy that parcel for another year, um, which uh, was good for the BLM to have time to do adequate analysis on your request, but it was bad if your goal was to start drilling there as soon as possible. Uh, they also got rid of the master leasing plan process and most um, relevant to this discussion, they shorted the time for comments and protests. So generally the Bureau of Land Management was allowing 30 days for comments and 30 days for protests, sometimes even allowing scoping comments and then later comments on the draft EA. And there, shortened these down to 15 days and for the protest down to 10 days, which is really hard to meet. There was a lawsuit about this, specifically related to greater sage grouse, and in September there was a preliminary injunction, which is a legal term for um, telling the government that they had to change how they were doing things until this lawsuit is um, fully uh, dealt with. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, by the way, so I'm using non-lawyer terms. Uh, and that said that if parcels are being offered in greater sage grouse habitat, then the comment period and the protest period have to be 30 days. And the Bureau of Land Management seems to have reacted to that by continuing to have 15 day and 10 day periods if there's no sage grass involved, like in New Mexico. And then in states where there is sage grass, they'll have some sales where they're offering only uh, parcels outside of sage grass habitat and still doing the, the um, 10 day protest period, uh, but then they're doing other sales that include parcels both in and out of sage grouse habitat, and they're allowing 30 days for those comments. Um, have a question from Barbara regarding master leasing plans. Does the BLM have to continue to manage oil and gas development under? Easter existing master leasing plans. There are master leasing plans um, in uh, Utah. There also are ones in Wyoming. So there are more than just the one in Moab. Um, and there's some in Colorado. 
And yes, if the master leasing plan is part of a finalized um, resource management plan, then they do have to continue to follow the resource management plan. However, if it was being considered, like the South Park master leasing plan was being considered in the Eastern Colorado RMP revision, they were required to stop considering it and not add it to the plan. Okay. And finally, um, in the section on the process, uh, what are the ways to engage? Rocky Mountain Wild's going to talk a lot about comments and protests. That's the focus of this webinar. However, there are other organizations, a bunch of the people that are on, who are really good at engaging the public, getting people involved, um, working with state agencies like the um, wildlife agencies. Um, they have uh, a lot, uh, can have a lot of influence on leasing, especially because there was a secretarial order to the Bureau of Land Management saying that they have to protect big game, winter habitat, and migration corridors. Um, that's one of our best hooks for um, getting somewhat reduced amount of leasing. Um, elected officials can have a lot of influence. Um, if you get a county commissioner, if you get the whole county commission up in arms and they go and talk to the governor and talk to the senators, that can make a real difference. Um, and then Rocky Mountain Wild and a bunch of other organizations are um, doing lawsuits saying that the Bureau of Land Management is not following the law and how they're doing things. And that's had some success, such as extending the comment period for uh, sage grass, when there's sage grass involved. Okay, Rocky Mountain Wild, well, let's move on. Rocky Mountain Wild provides some resources to all of you on this call, whether you're a volunteer for an organization or a staff member. Uh, we have uh, several different ways that we let people know when there um, is an opportunity to engage. So either in a comment period or a protest period. A lot of you are probably getting the rather plain emails that I send out um, to a bunch of different listservs. We all, and that gives some links to what you need to know. We're also sending out, um, Rocky Mountain Wild is sending out much more detailed uh, emails that collect information that you might have to follow some of the links in our less fancy emails. Um, and we target those towards uh, whatever state our people on our mailing list are in. And, um, that uh, really gives you that gives you some talking points as well as information about how to engage. And if you would like either of these, um, please email me, and uh, you can try to figure out. If you get the plain um, email, then you'll just be getting um, the oil and gas emails or whatever unless you're on one of these other mailing lists. If you get the more fancy ones, then you'll be getting other notifications from Rocky Mountain Wild. However, with the plain ones, you're going to be getting them for all the states we cover. Um, for the Rocky Mountain Wild emails, you'll just be getting them for the state that you're working on. Okay, along with our emails, we put some information on our website. And we have, um, so we have on this URL, which is rockymountainwide.org slash oil and gas uh, with the underscores. 
and then the name of the state you're working on. We work on states of the Rocky Mountain region. You can also pull down on the um, oil and gas um, menu and see which states we offer. So it could be Colorado, it could be New Mexico, which is new underscore New Mexico, Utah, uh, Montana, Wyoming, and Nevada. Nevada, we provide a little bit less information, um, but we still have this interactive map. I'm not going to go a look into a lot of detail about the interactive map today. If people are interested, uh, we could do another webinar on that. However, it works a lot like the Google Maps that you might use and a little bit different because it's a different platform. There's a thing up in the corner where you can zoom in or zoom out and um, part of what this shows is not just where the leases are which are these little um, brownish dots and the blue dots in this map but also shows um, areas that um, need to be protected from leasing or where only a certain amount of leasing is appropriate. And when you click on things on the map, it pops up information about um, the parcel that you're uh, hovering over and about any of these areas that um, where there are conflicts. And you get a little box with arrows and triangles in the corner and you can click through those. Uh, again, I'm happy to talk to people more about how to use that map. Um, just uh, don't want to focus on that today. Um, and we also create a spreadsheet that is the result of our assessment of biological impact stream, which is something that we created, where we have collected a whole bunch of geographic um, information about where areas are that are important to species, uh, areas that are um, uh, important uh, conservation lands. Uh, and so this, in this case, we have the serial number uh, for a parcel and we know that Colorado Parks and Wildlife indicated that there was a high potential that black prairie, black tailed prairie dogs would be there. We also know on a different parcel that the um, Colorado Natural Heritage Program has identified a potential conservation area called the Central Shortgrass um, area. And Megan will talk a little bit more about this spreadsheet um, when she's doing uh, her portion of the presentation. Um, and my screen is frozen. Okay. Let me just go back quickly on our uh, upcoming uh, web page, upcoming lease sale web page. There's the map. That's going to take up pretty much all of your screen when you first get there. You need to scroll down if you want to find the spreadsheet. There'll be information about the different sales if you're interested in the June sale. Um, it provides some information about how to engage. And then um, the last two bullet items usually. Um, have a link to where you can download the spreadsheet. You can also download the parcels in Google Earth or in um, GIS format uh, if you are good at using either of those technologies. You can start looking at it yourself. Um, or if you're just good at spreadsheets, then you have this information and you can make very specific comments that um, the Bureau of Land Management needs to pay attention to the fact that there's poodles that are jumping mouse in this area. There's more information. These are big spreadsheets. You can find more information about 
pre-built fab spike showing across. Okay, we also have a web page where we have some tools. Um, so we call it our own GAP toolkit or toolbox. And you can download um, some um, uh, documents. And I just noticed that there is a message in chat. So let me um, read that. Um, so going back to the spreadsheet, the parcel number changes between scoping and lease sale announcements. Does your spreadsheet include both numbers? Uh, yes, we um, make sure that we are including the number uh, for the uh, both the sale announcement and then the um, sometimes we'll also have the number that was used earlier. Sometimes we won't. It depends on the state, but we will always make sure to have the number that um, is associated. Um, with the sale notice if we're at the protest period. Uh, in Colorado, we do show both numbers. In Wyoming, um, the old number isn't meaningful anymore because it might have just changed from 10 to 8, so we don't keep that old number, but uh, BLM Wyoming posts a, um, a table that shows the mapping. Thank you for your question. Okay, finally, uh, we're going to talk about a comment guide that Megan put out recently um, that gives information on how to write comments specifically when there are impacts on wildlife and plant species, but it also has some general information about uh, how to write good comments. So let me turn things um, over to Megan. Um, do you want to talk through this slide first and then uh, take over the screen? That sounds great. Hi, everyone. So Rocky Mountain Wild recently put together a guide to writing comments, which focuses on um, impacts of oil and gas leasing on wildlife and plant species. Um, and we did this because we don't have capacity to comment on every lease or every parcel in every state, and almost all parcels will have some kind of wildlife or plant impact, and so we wanted to give people a tool um, to do effective comments on the impacts of oil and gas on wildlife and plant species. Um, so the link to the guide is, is here on the webinar, and it has three elements. There, there's a guide, which I'll walk you through um, in a minute, which basically functions as a decision tree so that you can go through and use all of Rocky Mountain Wild's different resources to figure out what species are in the parcel um, and what the impacts to those species might be and write really effective comments. And then, um, and that's basically set up so that you can skip um, steps that aren't relevant for you. Um, or that aren't relevant to the lease sale or the partial parcel in question. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the second element is a um, set of really detailed instructions and resources that you can use to really dive down and write very technical comments. Um, and then the last piece is a comment template. Um, and so the information that you gather as you go through the comment guide um, can be entered into a comment template that you can then submit to BLM. So it takes a little bit of the work out of writing comments. I want to note that the guide is um, in kind of a beta testing stage right now. So we just completed it and we have it out to folks for review. Um, and we will be putting it into a nicer format soon and making some improvements. So if you use it um, in the next few weeks, just note that it's kind of a beta version, and we would love you guys' feedback and comments on it. And and actually, generally speaking, it'd be great to have feedback to continue improving it as we move forward. And let me make uh, one more note: is that um, you do not have to follow this really write down this really long URL of 
how to get there, there is a link from our um, oil and gas toolkit page to the guide. Page. Um, I guess my other note is the other reason that Megan wrote this is because she figured all of this stuff out and she was doing it for a long time and she wants to make sure she's not the only person who knows how to do this. Okay, I'm going to uh, make Megan the host. I'm not here just so you know we're not experts on webinars. So we'll see exactly uh, how this works, but uh, pretty soon her screen will come up. Make it stop showing the diaries. Okay, so if you go up here uh, to the video options, um, then let me see if I can make it go away. Just one minute while we figure out a little technical difficulty here. Um, I don't know how to do that, so. Oh, here we go. Can you share your So yeah. Here thought I turned it over to you so you can let me, uh, sorry for the technical difficulties, let me, okay, our host now. There we go. Thank you for your patience. All right. Thanks so much for um, waiting for us to figure that out. So this is the guide to writing comments on the impacts of leaf sales on wildlife and plant species. And I'm going to scroll through this introductory language here so you don't have to look at it. Um, and basically the way it's set up is so you can go through a decision tree and figure out what species are present in the parcel, and then kind of go through a process of figuring out what the impacts to those species might be and what your legal hooks might be in comments to BLM. And so you can see that there's a list of questions here. And as you get through the questions, um, you'll get to these points where you can answer yes or no, and it will take you to the next relevant section of the decision tree. So it starts out um, having you determine what species might be present in, in or near the parcel. And we include some information on species that might be near the parcel because a lot of animals move around and oil and gas has impacts sometimes outside of the footprint of just the parcel. And the, the first piece of this is to look at whether there are special status species that may be present in the parcel. Um, and special status species are species that have some kind of legal status uh, with the Bureau of Land Management and the other public land management agencies. So it includes species that are protected under the Endangered Species Act, um, species that are listed as Bureau of Land Management um, sensitive species or Forest Service sensitive species and also bald and golden eagles, because there are some specific acts that, that provide those species with some protection. And so in order to find this out, you can, you can click on this link, and it will take you to a guide, a step-by-step -step guide, um, to use all of Rocky Mountain Wild's tools to figure out whether there are special status species in the parcels, and what the status of those species is. 
And this looks like a lot of information, um, but it, it can actually go pretty quickly. Um, and you just kind of go through it step by step. And when you get done with that, go back to the comment guide and you'll have the information that you need to answer these questions here. Um, so then that gives you the ability to say, BLM, there is an endangered species in this parcel. It's listed as threatened, and, and this is what it is. Um, and the same thing for, for BLM and Forest Service sensitive species. And when you get through that step, if you have special status species in the parcel, you're going to click yes. And then it will take you down to this next step. And what you want to do next is think about whether you want to focus just on writing comments on the impacts on special status species. And that can be a really good use of your time if special status species are present in the parcels because BLM has a stronger um, legal requirement to look at impacts to those species. Oh, Megan, I'm not sure it's showing the screen that you're on. Oh no. So if you go down, okay. find where the share up here, and make sure you're doing the, the new share. Go to the left one, I see. New share. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, do people see that now? Still not seeing. Let's see if you can you share the whole your whole How about now? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so does everybody, everybody sees that? Great. Um, so, um, again, we're at the point where you're determining whether or not um, you want to focus on special status species, and like I said, that can be a good use of your time. But let's say that you work for an organization that's um, concerned with big game or other species. Then you can click on um, this second link here, and that will take you through a similar kind of process for finding out whether the lease sale conflicts with other species of management interest. So um, things like elk and mule deer and bighorn sheep um, and some fish species. And that's focused on. Um, Species that we know agencies like Colorado Parks and Wildlife care about, but it can also include any other species that's of interest to you or your organization. And so you go through a similar process for those species, and there's a similar step by step guide that you can look at to answer those questions. And there's a question now from Barbara, mm -hmm. and she asks, um, do you have any visibility into the decision tree that Colorado Parks and Wildlife uses to make comments for the BLM as a cooperating agency? And do you think we're, our decision tree would be similar to theirs? I think it would be similar to theirs. The only difference is that um, it includes some more um, detail in the detailed instructions on endangered species um, that gets at the um, you know requirements associated with DSA listing and Parks and Wildlife isn't as concerned with that, um, but I think that they they line up pretty well. So then the next um, step. So I have a question actually. Sure. Does your decision tree include um, uh, uh, big game species? It does. It does. Okay. It does. Okay. That's probably a big focus for Colorado mm -hmm. Parks and Wildlife. Right. And some some of the criteria that you get into later for deciding what the impacts are come from Colorado Parks and Wildlife as well. Um, so once you've answered those questions, the guide will take you to the comment template. And you could go ahead and enter that information and complete your comments at that time if you're in a situation where you um, have limited time, it's a short comment period, um, and you've spent the amount of time you want to spend on it. Um, if you want to continue, then there, there are several additional steps 
And in each of the next steps, you get more information to make your comments um, more detailed and stronger. So you can look at um, whether there's evidence that the habitat in the parcel is occupied, um, how much habitat and what type is in the parcel, and whether it's habitat that's really important to the species. So this will walk you through, let's say you're interested in elk, um, the difference between elk might just wander through the parcel and it's an elk production area that's really important for calving. It will get you to that information. And there's a similar um, really detailed step-by-step -step guide there. Um, and then again, you can kind of take an off-ramp here and, and write comments with just that information. Um, and, and go to the comment template and enter that information in. Um, and then it, it kind of keeps going like that. At each stage, you can sort of add more detail. So, um, you know, you could, this, this kind of walks you through looking at specific impacts to the species. So you could write about things that are associated with oil and gas that are going to affect a species like roads and wells and those kinds of things. Um, and then this last part is for um, once BLM has done an actual NEPA analysis, it walks you through kind of assessing how good their analysis is. Um, and, and then it kind of walks you through determining whether or not BLM has met different legal requirements like Endangered Species Act requirements and NEPA requirements. Um, and I think we're kind of getting low on time here, but you can see um, it's, it's generally set up to kind of walk you through this process. Um, and then maybe just quickly I'll show you the comment template so you can see what that looks like. Um, so it's, it's kind of pre-written comments. Are, are you seeing that now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's pre-written comments, and it's got um, sections where you can enter the information that you collect. And the red in this document is instructions. So I know it seems kind of overwhelming to go through that um, really quickly um, in this webinar, but we're definitely happy to do a more detailed webinar on this guide in the future if people are interested. And when we get into a, a new format, um, it'll be set up so it auto-fills the comment template. So it'll be a little bit simpler to get through all those resources. This is really exciting. <laughs> it's, uh, great to have some of your background uh, documented. And one of the nice things about this, um, this um, guide is that you can um, go at a fairly high level and go ahead and submit your comments or protests at a high level, or you can dig deeper if there is some particular species that you're interested in. Okay, I'm going to work, try to figure out how to get back to my slides. Okay, here we are. Thank you, Megan. And I'm going to just um, go back to go to the map up here. I'm going to um, unmute people, and I'm going to um, actually go back and try to answer Mark's question. Um, which is where is the comment template online? And it is on the RockyMountainWild.org webpage um, in our toolbox, which you can find um, through our menus, or you can type in RockyMountainWild.org slash OG toolbox. And uh, that link has already been um, added. Is the presentation available for download? Not yet. We will put the 
Um, I'll put the slides up, and uh, we are also recording this so that people who weren't here can listen, or you can go back and see the um, uh, a part that uh, you want to study some more. Um, that may take a little longer to get up, but uh, we'll get that up soon. So we will have all that information in the oil and gas toolbox page. Okay, um, so the links on the left are things on our site. Uh, again, please email me to get on the list. Also, if you are not in a group um, for your state, but you are working on oil and gas comments in um, Colorado or Utah or uh, Wyoming or uh, Nevada, there are uh, groups that have been put together. Um, C, question. Uh, I may have missed the entry into the decision tree. Do you have a particular, uh, enter a particular parcel to start down the tree? You don't enter a particular parcel. Um, that happens kind of first when you're looking at the online map. Um, and actually, um, it'll take the, the detailed instructions will take you to the online map and tell you how to use it to, to start looking at a parcel. So you can't start with one parcel um, and see what is in that parcel and then go through the tree that way. But you can also look at the, the the sale as a whole and use the spreadsheet. So it kind of depends on whether you're, say, with a nonprofit who's interested in commenting on the entire sale and all of the parcels, or you're someone in a local area who just wants to look at one parcel. And it provides options for going through it um, either way. Okay, let me go ahead and unmute people so if folks want to chime in um, with. Uh, questions uh, verbally or uh, making comments. Hey, I hear some people. So we can hear you all now if you've got a question. And you can mute yourself if you're just uh, chatting. I uh, do have a question. Uh, does it depend on the administration and power as to whether the BLM will pull parcels objected to by the National Park Service? I would say it depends on the administration to some extent, but um, entities at the local level also have some power to remove parcels from the lease sale, so field office directors and field office biologists. And so, while it overall kind of depends on the administration, Sometimes you get someone good in the LM who's willing to pull a parcel. Hey, I just uh, muted everyone um, because there was a lot of uh, echoes. So please write your questions into the chat. Uh, Let me go ahead and see if I can figure out where um, Pete is. Are you uh, logged in as Earthworks? Let me. Um, That's me. Uh, okay, go ahead. I think I'm still muted. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks for this webinar. Thanks for the toolkit. Thanks for everything uh, Rocky Mountain Wild does. I find it immensely helpful with all the work that many of us do. Um, one problem that, that I'm, I'm continually bumping into with federal lease sales is that it's very difficult to tell who is working on what. And um, a lot of people don't have the bandwidth or time, but they want their organization to be reflected on, on, on lease sale comments, EAs, scoping. Uh, protests, everything basically. I'm wondering about the possibility of somehow um, having, a, um, and Rocky Mountain Wild might be the best group to do this, to host a, it's sensitive information, it might need to be password protected or something, but basically a spreadsheet, a live spreadsheet that shows 
what groups are working on what phases of what lease sales in which states so that for local groups that don't have the expertise and bandwidth to do comprehensive pro, uh, um, comments or protests, but say Wilderness Society is, for example, or Wild Earth Guardians is, that local groups have a way to know who is working on what. Because the way it works now is everything goes out on RMEC and then there's just random requests. Oh, who's working on this and who's working on that? And it all gets hashed out by email chain and it's very confusing and it's not streamlined. I'm wondering about the possibility of, of a new tool that would allow us to, to all be on the same page because this has come up in Montana just in the last few weeks. It's impossible to figure out who's doing what and it's like herding cats sometimes and we could eliminate all that confusion by just having it documented somewhere. And in that, a spreadsheet like that could also include the deadlines, the key deadlines, and um, it would just make everyone's work a lot easier so that they know who to reach out to if they'd like to be um, signatories on comments or protests. So that's, that, that's my suggestion. I think that would be immensely helpful. Okay, I think that's a great suggestion. We already have a response uh, from Carly in Utah that she is hosting a group in Utah and trying to map out who's working on what. Um, and uh, so that might be a good starting place is for the statewide groups to work on that. But if any of the statewide groups would like Rocky Mountain Wild to host uh, um, online spreadsheet, we'd be happy to do that. Um, there's a tool that um, uh, that some of the legal groups are using to share the information. So um, there have been some, some attempts to do this before, but I think it's a really good idea. So thank you. Yeah, okay. Th thanks. Appreciate the consideration. Um, are there any other questions? It is um, 3.01. It's about time to wrap up. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, again, we will put a recording of this up, and we'll follow the suggestion to put the slides up as well onto our oil and gas toolbox webpage. And I really appreciate that everyone is working so hard on this. I uh, want to do a quick um, uh, promotion for our GIS services as well. I really enjoy making maps that help you tell your story about what you're doing for conservation. Um, and we um, uh, have a lot of experience with that in Rocky Mountain Wild, and we're also looking for ways to bring in a little bit of money. So if you um, <laughs> something and don't have the capacity to bring on your own GIS, professionals, um, we're definitely here for you. And we should also note that um, TWS, the Wilderness Society, has been a, a great help to us in funding the development of some of these tools, so we really appreciate that. Yes, um, and there are a lot of organizations that are doing great work uh, on this, the Sierra Club, Conservation Colorado, um, a lot of the local and statewide groups across the West. Thank you very much, and uh, please um, be in touch. And goodbye.